Hello everybody watching. I'm gonna be making a quilt rack in this video and this was a project that I finished quite some time ago. Just haven't gotten around to editing the video. It was something that I was asked if I could do to give as a Christmas present. So the first thing that I started doing here was I cut the angle for the top right out of the middle to guarantee that those two would match up side to side and then I'm using the uh, table saw with the miter crosscut to cut them both to length. And the next thing that was kind of needing to be done is I needed to be ripping a couple of boards that I could later use for various other pieces like the bottom feet or the top kind of boards that will eventually hold those rungs or the rungs themselves so I get to ripping all of those pieces on the table saw. Here I've got all of the rung pieces. I actually made four of them just in case one of them didn't work out, or if I wanted to do some experimentation with how I was going to make those. I have four rungs here, and I'm marking these all out to length for some tenons that will be put on them and used later. I'm marking them all out at the same time, so I make sure that everything lines up. And then I go down to the other side and mark those as well. Here I'm marking for the length of the tenon. I used the piece, uh, or a piece rather, of one of the cutoffs to get that width. Um, it doesn't entirely work out, but the thought was there. <laughs> the next thing I'm doing is cutting these to length, squaring off the ends, getting those down to the mark just to make sure that I have the right length pieces. That one was actually for the shelf. And now I'm working on all three of the rungs to get those all cut up to length. Now I'm working on the tenons and the way that I do that, at least for this particular project, is I have a stop block set up on my bandsaw and the fence set up to the width that I want to take off. And then I rip down, I guess it's kind of like a resaw cut, but I do that on the two cheeks and then I lay it down and cut the two shoulders. And that just kind of is a, it's a pretty quick way to get through all of these cuts that I need to do. Um, you can see that there was what, six of them that I had to do and doing them all by hand is a good way to lead to in inconsistency in my abilities. <laughs> And then after I've cut those on the bandsaw, I have my table saw blade raised up just high enough to cut those off. And I have a block there clamped to the fence of my table saw to give me a place to stop so that I get the same shoulder all the way around on all three of the pieces, on all six ends. And I don't have to worry about the work piece being slid against the fence as I move it forward and avoid any of the risks with a piece getting pinched between the blade and the fence and getting thrown back at my face at a very high rate of speed. Something I've been able to avoid so far, and I'm gonna try to make it my entire woodworking hobby career avoiding. <laughs> Highly recommended. All right, so the next part is cutting, well, not really a tenon yet, it's just cutting the shoulder for the tenon at the bottom of the side pieces. And I largely do that in the same way. So I've got a stop block set up. I use the miter gauge and run that across the table saw blade. And that's still at the same height that it was for the uh, tenons on the other pieces. So now I'm using my Stanley number 45, or at least one of them. And I'm just going to use that here to cut the tenon 
well, more of the tenon anyway. And so I have it set up to where I will stop once I get to the depth that the table saw cut. And once I do that, I will use the router plane. That is to clean it up, get it a consistent depth, just so that way I can use this to make sure that the bottom is flat. So if I had the plane tipped in with the number 45, I can clean that up and fix it here. And then I'll do this on both sides so that I can make sure that that tenon ends up right in the middle. That's always ideal. And uh, yeah, now I'm making a lot of shavings because shavings. I don't know. Just I'm just being artsy or something. Something like that. Anyway, now what I'm working on is using a regular plane to plane the rest of it off. So the number 45 left that dado, mm, well, that was about an inch from the bottom. So I'm just taking another hand plane and I'm gonna clean all of that off. And then I'll have the entirety of the tenon all the way across the board. I am checking to make sure that I have the thickness. That was a scrap that I was using. And you always got to make sure you clean up once in a while. I actually don't particularly enjoy standing on shaving, so I, I try to sweep up more frequently than I probably have to, but, you know, clean shop, something, something. So here is a side piece, and this is kind of roughly what I'm going to cut out. Now we cut that out. You can see those two tenons, and this is why I wasn't too worried about what was on the ends. You know, if I accidentally had some blowout with the number 45 or the, the uh, actual hand plane, it is not that big of a deal because I'm cutting it off here. So. Again, back to the bandsaw for cutting curves. You can just kind of run that through right along the line. And I've got both pieces taped together. And the reason for that is then I only have to make the cuts once, one per each side. And I'm also going to make sure that they match that way. So I don't have to worry about trying to follow the same line and then trying to, you know, sand or, you know, do whatever file down to the line. And okay, so this one ended up going a little bit off the line here and this one didn't and now I gotta figure out which one I'm gonna do and so just avoid all that tape them together and then uh, just cut to your line I'm not usually that brave for the record and and well I guess it doesn't really matter when the shape is is I guess not that important it, close enough nobody will know right <laughs> so after I cut that out, now I'm just kind of cleaning things up with a chisel along the tenon there because I had to cut the tenon a little bit narrower. Next, I come in with a spoke shave and I'm going to use this to roughly clean up the cuts from the bandsaw. I mean, even if you have a really nice bandsaw blade, a lot of times you end up with little wavy lines uh, with the with the non-carbide tipped ones. So that's basically what I'm cleaning up here. And it's a lot faster in most cases than trying to use either sandpaper or a hand file or a rasp or something like that. So this is a way to actually cut it and you get little shavings depending on, on how much you're cutting, I guess. But um, yeah, I just go to down. You can, there you can kind of see some of those marks, the high spots from the, the bandsaw cut are getting, you know, shaved away, whereas the low you can still see. So just have to go all the way around it and clean everything up and then hit it with a little sandpaper just for that final little finish.
And so there you have it. There's the two sides all cut out, shaped, and ready to go. Now I'm drilling some starter holes in this is one of the pieces for the feet and what that starter hole is going to be for is to kind of get a start on the mortises that I'm going to have to cut into this to join it to the side pieces. Now this is probably one of my favorite machines if not my absolute favorite machine that I own in my workshop. Uh, this is a Barnes foot powered mortiser. It is an old, old, old school machine from late 1800s. And what it does is it cuts mortises. And rather than the modern equivalent, which is a square chisel with a drill bit in the middle called a hollow chisel mortiser, this actually just holds what is essentially just a mortise chisel and you step on a lever it pulls that thing down and it just chews right through the wood obviously there's some limitations i'm not a particularly heavy individual so i have to take small bites <laughs> but this is just it's a really fun tool to use it's a really kind of neat just contraption and i was really excited to find this thing and i love using it whenever i can as long as you keep the chisel sharp It'll do a great job, and it's a heck of a lot easier to make repeated mortises using this thing than, than trying to smack them out by hand with a mallet and chisel. And then once you've gone through, there's a bunch of stuff that gets wedged in there. So you just take a smaller chisel and slowly pry all that stuff out of there. And sooner or later, you've dug out the whole thing and you've got your bordis. And then what I do is I come in with the router plane. This is to sneak up on the final fit for the mortise, or I guess the tenon into the mortise. So I leave the tenon a little bit oversized at first, and then I do a test fit, and I take off a little bit on each side, test fit again, keep doing that until it fits the way I want it to, which is usually snugly, with, with I guess not so much force that I'm worried about breaking the thing in half but it's just a, a nice tight fit and then label your joints so you don't forget which one goes where and screw it up <laughs> and there we go so same thing for the second one repeat and put that one on there And here we've got the two side pieces and their feet. Next thing on the list was to get the feet cut out. So the first thing I do is I cut the outside curve on the top of the foot. And then I make the inside curve on the bottom of the foot. And there's two relief cuts cut there because I wasn't sure if my blade would make it around that corner. They did just fine, so I didn't need it. I did need the one in the middle. Well, I guess I didn't really need it, but it was just a little bit easier to use that one in the middle. And then because I didn't need it on the first one, I just went for it with the second curve without making any of those relief cuts. And, and that worked fine. While I had the bandsaw set up, I went ahead and taped the two, I'm hesitant to call them scroll boards because I really didn't carve any scroll work into it, but 
for lack of a better term, the scroll boards. <laughs> the two ends that the slats will go into that the quilt will be hung with. And so there's just a, a round on both ends that goes a little bit over 180 degrees. You can kind of see here, not quite to 270 degrees, but somewhere in between there. <laughs> and then that's on both ends and then there's just a flat in the middle. Something to give it a little bit more of a design, a little less just square ends and that kind of stuff. But then I come back in once I've cut the curves and I make the straight cut and this is actually where it's going to attach to the top of the side pieces. So this is going to be kind of recessed a little bit. Just a little bit of a design thing. And I start out with a rasp to get this kind of matching. That was not going as quickly as I was hoping or as nicely. And I realized I can't keep it as flat. So I grabbed a hand plane and I'm going to do as much as I can with this before I come back to sand the rest of it. And I also take the rasp or the file and shape the curves just to kind of get rid of the marks from the bandsaw and to even out the, the round a little bit and get everything down to the line that I was hoping to. And then hit it with some sandpaper to further smooth things out. Back to that mortiser again. This time cutting the mortises in those top pieces. And these are a little bit different because there's two deep mortises on the ends and then the whole thing is shallow through the middle. And then you just take it over, do a test fit. And it doesn't always fit the first time. In fact, it almost never fits the first time because I'm a chicken. <laughs> so what I do is you kind of go over there and test fit it and clean stuff out, see if there's something that's you know preventing it from going all the way on because it's bottoming out on a piece that needs to be removed or if it's getting too tight in the bottom once the, the mortise and the tenon start getting close to being all the way on. But either way, just kind of come back, clean it up, put it back on and sooner or later it'll fit. And if it doesn't, then I guess you'll just have to make a new one. <laughs> Been there before. Now for some more hole drilling. And this is, for the same reasons, a uh, slightly different kind of mortise, but these are for the mortises that will hold those slats in place. And these ones are a little bit different because usually a mortise goes kind of, when you're chopping with the chisel, it goes straight across the grain, but these are diagonal. So they're, they're a little bit different and a little bit, honestly, I think trickier. You have to be a little bit more careful when you're chopping these with a chisel because you're once you're doing the ends of them, you're kind of going more with the grain, so you have to be careful not to make things split out. But for the cleaning up of the sides with a chisel, that's that's pretty easy. But these are the cuts that, that I'm always careful about. And it always sucks when you drop your chisel. Uh, number one rule that I've learned is if you're going to drop the chisel, drop the chisel. <laughs> Don't try to catch it. It's a lot easier to sharpen it than it is to fix up your finger. <laughs> Uh, yeah, so then I just kind of continue cleaning out the mortise until everything is cleaned up to the lines and we're good to go on all six of them. And because I'm always anxious to see what things look like, I can't ever make it to a point where I can do a sort of mock assembly without doing a mock assembly. And for right now, those tenons on the end of those slats are a little bit long. I was originally thinking I was going to make these uh, just a set of through tenons, so you would actually see them on the outside. But the more I thought about it, the less I liked that idea. So for right now, those tenons are still a little bit long, but I do intend to trim them down so that I don't have those exposed tenons on the outside. I just, I think it just ended up a little bit cleaner that way. And overall, I'm pretty happy that I decided to do that. So this is where we stand at the moment. Mm -hmm. 
And back at it once again. I've got the Stanley number 45 out. This time I have it set up with a three quarter inch wide iron. And I'm plowing a groove right down the middle. And that is for this little brace piece. And the reason for that is I thought that this would help kind of fight against the racking forces. So if somebody were to push on the top corner of it towards the opposite bottom corner diagonally across it, I was worried that just having that shelf wouldn't be enough to really help make it stable. So I put this runner in the bottom of it that will span the same distance just to hopefully help with that because everything else was more or less kind of running straight across. But next thing I had to do was to do the same thing as those slats, just drilled out the holes and cleaned it up with a chisel. And the shelf will be mounted in both of the side pieces the same way. And that's pretty much all there is to that, I guess. And then we see if it fits. And just for consistency, so I didn't accidentally screw myself up somewhere in the middle, these are also a little bit long for the tenons, just to make sure that everything was consistent. Now what I'm doing is I have the shaped feet and I'm finding the center. And from there I measure out to find two more places further out. And what I'm gonna be doing is drilling some holes that I'm gonna eventually use to peg that bottom tenon in place. And there's a couple of reasons for that. One, I think it'll add a little bit more strength. Two, the tenon is pretty wide and wood has a tendency to move when the moisture in the air changes. And since I know where this was going at the moment, at least for now, is it a climate that gets both very humid and warm summers and very, very cold and dry winters? that it could be a problem. So by using pegs in this joint, instead of just relying on the glue, it kind of makes it have a mechanical connection rather than purely through the glue. So if over time things start to expand and contract because of moisture changes, these pegs will stay in place, even if the glue decides to let go. And it's just a, a little something to give me peace of mind. And the other advantage to this is that I'm using a technique called draw boring, which is essentially it's an offset hole on the tenon. So when I assemble this, they won't quite line up, but they'll be really close. And so it'll pull the joint together so I don't have to clamp it, which will be important later because with the angles, it's not easy. So after I located those holes, I'm drilling them at the drill press and I just took a scrap of the tenon that I cut off the bottom of the side piece just to make sure that I had something in between the two sidewalls of the mortise to ensure I wasn't gonna have any issues with that breaking or cracking just because it's a really wide mortise and I wouldn't be particularly happy if I you know, went to drill a hole and ended up cracking one of the walls of the mortise. So that's what that was in there for. Probably wasn't needed on the outside ones, but eh, little peace of mind goes a long, long way. Once I've got the foot back onto the tenon, I'm using the same drill bit that I drilled the holes in the foot just to mark the centers for where the holes, well, not, not quite where they'll go, but they'll at least tell me where the center of the hole is on the tenon. So what I end up doing is I drill them slightly offset, a little bit more towards the end of the tenon so that they'll pull it together like I was talking about before. And and then I just have to drill them out, and that should be all there is to those. And then I'm just adding a little bit of a bevel or a chamfer with my countersink on the holes. 
and that's just to help that pin slide into that hole a little bit since there's going to be an offset. Uh, you wouldn't want to have to go pounding on this thing with a ridiculous hammer hit because you do run the risk of it not quite going through and potentially cracking or breaking something. I've had it happen before where you go to drive a peg through and you actually end up just blowing a huge chunk out the backside of whatever you're pounding the peg through. So now I turn to the noisy powered router, the one with the tail, the one that kills the electrons, and I've just got a chamfer bit, and I'm just using this to kind of rough it out and take away some of the wood that's that would otherwise take a while to, to plane off, but I could have done this by hand, yes, but you know, when you've got three of them and you're under a deadline, hand router it is, plus I just got it, so you gotta use it, right? <laughs> So then I have the twin screw parallel jaw clamp to hold this thing up on edge. And then I've also got it held on the workbench between two of the dogs. And I've just got a hollow base on my Stanley number 45. They have hollows and rounds. And what it does is it cuts part of a circle. I'm just using that to give the top a radius rather than giving it so much of a radius that it basically does a 180 degrees of a circle, I decided to go this route because it kind of eases the corners and knocks it off, but it gives it a much more gentle curve and it's a little bit more subtle and I, I it kind of fit with the rest of it a little bit better because there's really no other rounded corners apart from the scroll board. So there you can kind of see the profile. Next up, it's time to glue some stuff together. So rather than trying to glue everything together all at once, I'm going to be just gluing the two feet to the two sides first. And how I do that is, obviously I put glue on the tenon, put a little bit on the mortise. And then I have a couple of pegs. And once I have everything where I want it, I had a center line, so that's what I kept doing there is I'd move it up so I could get the center line. But now I'm driving those pegs in with a backer board, so if it did get hung up, it wouldn't accidentally blow through the backside. And then I pound them all the way through and move on to the slats. As you can see, I've already cut these down to their actual final length. The first three is pretty easy. The second three is a little bit more obnoxious because you're trying to get all three of them lined up at the same time and you got to try and get you know the first one and then the middle one and then the end one and try not to hit the middle of it with glue so you don't have to worry about the glue screwing up the finish and all that crap but yep actually went fairly well this one i did actually clamp up because this one well i didn't have any pegs for these so i kind of didn't have a choice but the side pieces are both perpendicular to the slats that are being glued into them so it's pretty easy to clamp these up probably could have gotten away with fewer clamps but well you've got clamps so you might as well use them right and next up i'm gonna glue the bottom shelf in place also obviously having been cut down to length previously at the same time as the, the three slats and so this got a little bit obnoxious actually because I was trying to glue this in place but I didn't have the top pieces on it yet so I kind of had to try and balance it and then I kind of finally decided to just put the top pieces on it while I put the glue on this even though I wasn't gluing the top pieces on it it, it just allowed it to kind of help keep everything where it was supposed to be and with the top on it, it was a lot easier to move and get down onto the floor where I could put some clamps on the shelf. So 
I know end grain isn't the best glue surface, but I figured why not <laughs> give myself as, as much as I can because it doesn't really hurt anything. And now I just drive those pegs through, same as down at the bottom, and that holds everything in place. I hate glue on my fingers. Gotta be really careful so you don't get glue fingerprints all over whatever you're working on. And then after everything was dried and sanded, I started to apply the finish. What we went with was light walnut Danish oil. I really like Danish oil as a finish, especially on oak. I just like the way that it kind of soaks into the grain and it gives a really nice kind of soft feel, kind of more so than any of the other finishes that I typically use. I, I'll use shellac and polyurethane a lot too, but I just, I just love the feel of Danish oil on a finished sanded piece. So I go applying all of this with a rag, just kind of applying it a couple times. This was after the first coat. In the video, it looks like the middle section is really, really dark compared to the top and the bottom pieces, but it actually isn't quite that bad in person. And after a couple more coats, the other, other pieces kind of start Kind of, they all kind of converge in color. So here I've got my respirator on just because it's the second and third coats and the first one was starting to get a little smelly in the shop. So here are some final pictures of that with all of the finish applied.